Cool. And I will get cracking. There might be a few stragglers, but we'll, we'll get started here anyway. And just to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm dulling in from today, which are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and extend my um, effectively support to elders past, present and emerging. Um, thanks to those that are just jumping on here. I'm a terrible multitasker, so I'm just having a look through there. We've got, um, we're about one minute past, so I'd like to say thank you. Thanks to you all for jumping on. And yeah, my name is Josh Lambert. I'm a director at Pinnacle Health Group. And I was just having a look. It looks like I've been joined here as well by Trent Marsh, who's the, the National Health and Wellbeing Manager at Pinnacle Health Group as well. So thanks for jumping on, Trent. Uh, like I was saying to those that were on the call a little bit early, super informal session today. So feel free to grab your lunch. Uh, feel free to grab a cup of tea or a coffee or whatever you might need to do. This is a half an hour session you're welcome to ask questions through the chat box or interrupt me at any time and, and we'll go from there. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So we're going to go through today, there'll be a little bit of introduction to uh, myself and Trent and, and Tom and, and who we are at Pinnacle Health Group and to how we do things at Pinnacle Health Group. That's more so so you get an understanding of our, our take on this really and, and why we feel that looking at the space that we occupy and also why we feel that we've been um, exposed to to these workplace health and safety changes a little bit. We'll go into psychosocial safety, a little bit of, of what is psychosocial safety and, and how it impacts us. And then really the, the bulk of the session is going to be working through an example of a psychosocial hazard in the workplace and how to go through using the Safe Work Australia model code of practice, how to actually manage that um, manage that hazard. And then we'll look at really how to address these practically in the workplace. So what's already in place at your workplace? What does it mean for your workplace and, and how to do that? But I guess just to call out at the start, I feel like it's one of those financial type sessions where we call out and we say, uh, this doesn't constitute real financial advice. We'll, we'll say it in a similar way here that we're, we're not lawyers at Pinnacle Health Group. We, we didn't write the workplace health and safety rules, uh, nor are we across all the ins and outs of every state jurisdiction as well. So basically want to call out that this everything we discussed today is, is applying our own um, experiences with, with this, but also acknowledging that this is a these changes are fairly new and our understanding and, and hopefully every workplace's understanding and workplace leaders understanding is changing as we all learn more. And, and as I discussed uh, uh, when this first came out, we were using the analogy a little bit at Pinnacle Health Group that it's probably a little bit like when the GST came out in the mid 90s in Australia that a lot of accountants and financial advisors were really learning the implications of it in, in their particular line of work. So no doubt uh, you on the call here, if you're health and safety or HR or, or wherever you might sit, uh, are still working through that as well. So anyway, that's my little caveat there. <laughs> So Pinnacle Health Group will fly through this, guys, and, and it's not so much to uh, to really boast around what we do at Pinnacle Health Group, but more just to, to give that, that context around our discussion today. But if you haven't already worked with us or you haven't heard of Pinnacle Health Group, we've been around for over 15 years now. Uh, we consult over 200 workplaces on their, their health and wellbeing strategy and provide health and wellbeing programs for these workplaces. And um, as you will understand with me today, I always struggle with half an hour sessions because I talk way too much because I'm extremely passionate about this, but we believe that workplaces really shape wellbeing behaviours and that it's a responsibility of workplaces, not just to inspire healthy change for employees, but for the teams and the families and the communities that those employees then interact with. So we take our, our roles very seriously and, and hopefully that, that shines through today in, in this session. And what it is that we do, as I touched on wellbeing strategy, wellbeing programs, so that's anything from physical wellbeing support through to mental and social wellbeing support as well. Um, and we're also, you know, when we were first around, we were known most for our wellness centres, our corporate wellness centres at different workplaces across Australia. All right, let's get cracking. So as I said, if you've just jumped on the call, please feel free to interrupt me at any time here. It we want this to be a fairly uh, informal, interactive discussion. So use the chat box, raise your hand or your virtual hand, and feel free to hang around at the end as well. But like I said at the start, um, if you're just jumping on as well, this won't be laying out in 30 minutes. We, we won't be able to solve all the world's problems when it comes to psychosocial safety, but hopefully we can provide a, a bit of a um, contextual framework from um, from our side of things, which is, which is in the workplace wellbeing strategy. 
Now, some of you, hands up if you have already attended a Pinnacle Health Group Masterclass event in the past. A few hands there. If you have, you may already be familiar with what we call our space framework. And, um, and the space framework, if you're, if you're already quick enough to be following on here, this, the space framework is an acronym and, and it represents the, the five different pillars of employee wellbeing strategy that, that uh, we've created here. So you can see that the space, the S P A C N E, represents structure, psychological support, awareness, champions, and evaluation. Now, this is some this is a, a methodology that we've adopted for many years now. And the reason behind this methodology is to is to help our clients. You saw before that we work with over 200 workplaces, but it's to help our clients build out a robust wellbeing strategy. Um, and if we go through, I won't go through it in too much detail here because we do uh, go through it with the context of psychosocial safety in a moment, but not to go through every single element, but concepts like structure, it might sound really obvious that employee wellbeing strategy or employee wellbeing programs need to have structure. But if we look at structure uh, and look at the absence of structure uh, to really highlight this is you know, the opposite of having structure with the employee wellbeing strategy is being reactive, is applying a scattergun sort of ad hoc approach to employee wellbeing, which for many reasons um, is not sustainable and is not robust. So that's things like having at least 12 months, but, you know, more likely having two to three years mapped out of the strategy. Treating employee wellbeing very much like a, a whole business, like a whole business has a strategy, so should your employee wellbeing uh, processes. Psychological support is obviously what we're here to talk about today, but that is a key pillar. And we'll see with these new uh, changes to legislation and shining a light on the psychosocial aspects of work workplace health and safety laws that it is an absolutely crucial part of employee wellbeing. And it's something that isn't fixed with any, any one employee wellbeing program or one consultant coming into your workplace. It's something that is really a consultative group and team effort um, and it is very complex in in that awareness so we'll touch on that a, a bit more but the simple way we like to to talk of awareness is that at a workplace perception is reality so if there are employee well-being supports if there is a psychosocial uh, safety policy and procedures in place at a workplace unless employees are made aware of it unless there's a really great health and well-being culture at that workplace uh, it, it's it's very common that 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 all of those different services and, and different supports that are put in place just aren't really aren't really cutting the mustard. So awareness is crucial, and we're going to talk about ways that we can really raise awareness and and shine a light on all of the great support that I'm sure all of you uh, put a lot of work into at your respective workplaces. Champions is looking at how to get champions across your organisation, including leadership. Uh, we had a really great question. We did we sent out a, um, a bit of a vox pop just before today's session around what are some of the challenges that you guys are facing when it comes to implementing psychosocial support or acknowledging psychosocial safety. And and one really good response we had was around getting leadership buy in and, and acknowledgement that psychosocial safety is a really important issue and something that we need to work on. So thank you for for that contribution. And we're going to touch on today how to really shine a light on that. And evaluation. So evaluation is, we have a saying at Pinnacle Health Group uh, that what you can measure, you can manage. So it's really looking at what are the different data points that you're accessing at your workplace? Is it things like uh, engagement in your employee assistance program? Is it engagement in any other programs? Is it, um, do you have data on your work, workers' compensation claims, et cetera, et cetera? Using that data and information to then evaluate any changes that you make at your workplace so again we'll go through this in a bit more detail but that's just to really address the way we do things a little bit here at pinnacle health group but also how you can apply that framework uh you might have already got some ideas here as to how to how to apply that framework to your broader employee wellbeing strategy okay so what you guys are here for today is obviously to discuss psychosocial safety now Again, if you've just jumped on, we are not psychosocial safety specialists and outside of uh, Safe Work Australia, which we've actually also engaged in in previous um, masterclasses to present direct to, to our community on psychosocial safety, that every single workplace will have a different interpretation or different demands and hazards and risks that they're managing. So as that caveat right at the start, 
what you won't get out of today's session is great. I know exactly I can tick that box off and then move on to something else at work. It's not that simple. And I'm sure you guys are smart enough to know that. Um, but what we do know and, and, and how we can apply some of those, cha those changes or discuss some of those changes is, is in a broader overview, basically workplace health and safety laws were amended. And over the last couple of years, depending on which state you're in, you would have noticed that uh, those changes in legislation have been adopted to capture these new psychosocial safety requirements. So there is a, a review, it was called the Boland Review back in 2018. And what it identified was the need to address psychosocial safety in the broader workplace health and safety laws. Now, again, I'm speaking of this, I, I'm not the expert in those changes and all the steps that led to those changes. But certainly to use that analogy of, of the GST coming in, in in a financial sense, it has um, certainly been the most talked about topic with lots of our workplace clients. And Trent, who's on the call from Pinnacle Health Group as well, will attest to the fact that it really has dominated a lot of our, our conversations with clients and a lot of the the priorities in terms of workplace health and safety and, and employee well-being in those workplaces. Um, important things to know is that Safe Work Australia have created a model code of practice, and that's something that we will send after today's session, and we might even um, get an opportunity to, to share a link to that in the chat box today. But also that each state and territory um, has slightly different, I won't say interpretations of that, but have adopted the 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 processes in slightly different timeframes and, and slightly different views of that. So it is important, again, here's a lot of um, my asterisks at the start of the session, but make sure um, you are familiar, one, with the model code of practice, which is from Safe Work Australia, and also your, your state or territory guidelines to that or um, with the, the necessary governing bodies. Now, we're going to talk a lot about the model code of practice today because that's kind of like the Bible in terms of applying the new changes to psychosocial safety. Um, I want to see a show of hands. So who has already, who's already familiar with the model code of practice from Safe Work Australia? You can raise your hand or use the virtual hand at all. Okay. Looks like we've got a few. Um, yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for, for putting your hand up there. So, but like I said before, we're all, not only are our workplaces in different stages of understanding uh, psychosocial safety, but us as individuals and leaders, I mean, some of you on the call today might be really fresh in, in health, safety and wellbeing as well. And um, so it is a really good time to be around psychosocial safety, one, because there's been the legal changes, but two, because we're seeing the interaction and the interplay of that with the broader health, health and wellbeing strategy. So yeah, it's something we're super passionate about and looking forward to getting into it today. So by definition, um, now PCBU, just to, just to call this out at the start before we get into a little bit of legal jargon here, PCBU stands for a person conducting a business or undertaking. So effectively in, in the context of today's session, that's either a workplace, uh, be it a large organization, a small business, a sole trader, but effectively it's a, an organization and the legal uh, basically the legal jargon or, or, or the summary goes as follows. So a PCB you must ensure, so far as, as reasonably practicable, workers and other persons are not exposed to risks to their psychological or physical health and safety. Uh, they also must eliminate psychosocial risks in the workplace, or if that is not reasonably practicable, minimise these risks so far as is reasonably practical. Now, I really struggle to say practicable, so I got through that okay. But effectively, if we take a little bit of a step back here, what this is really saying is that it's a it's a responsibility, it's a legal responsibility now of workplaces, whether you're large or small, to as best as you can provide a safe environment, not just physically, but psychologically as well. Now, you saw earlier that we've been working in, in workplace health and safety for, for over 15 years now. And certainly when, and I'm, I'm a physiotherapist by background, and when we first began in workplace health and, and corporate health, it was very much the the role of the workplace health and safety team or officers or whatever the role might have been then to prevent physical health and safety risks. Um, they're obviously a lot easier to acknowledge, a lot easier to identify. And really the role to break it down was to prevent injury, prevent sickness, prevent death and, and anything along those lines of the physical health and safety. So really just to um, 
probably dumb this down for my level here a little bit, is just to say that there's really no changes in those laws at all. The only thing that have changed is that they're finally uh, addressing and identifying that psychosocial risks are as valid and are as important. And you don't need me to tell you that the understanding of mental health over that 15 years, or particularly recently, has increased significantly. And we've seen a, a lot of um, changes to our understanding, but also to the awareness and the um, I guess visibility on on how mental health and, and well-being can affect our broader well-being as well. So it's a really great um, and very progressive change to to these to this legislation. But really, it's not a huge change if you think about it. It's just really bringing it all into line. Okay, so again, that's a that's effectively by definition what the legislation states and. You will see that was taken from the Safe Work Australia Model Code of Practice. And now what we've got here as well is how do we manage these psychosocial risks? Now, some of you, regardless of whether you've been involved in managing psychosocial risks, but some of you that have managed uh, physical health, safety and well-being risks in your workplace may be familiar with this uh, with this code of practice here as well. And effectively, it's it's how to identify hazards, how to assess risks, how to control risks and then how to review those control measures in a flow chart at your workplace. So we'll go through this and, and in a moment, we're gonna talk through an example of um, quite a common psychosocial hazard in workplaces and how to go through this process with a set psychosocial hazard in the workplace. So as you can see there, the first step is really identifying the hazard. Um, hazards, the next slide, we're actually going to go through the different types of psychosocial hazards that exist in workplaces. But the first step is, is identifying the hazards. Once we've done that, it's then a process of really looking, consulting with employees, consulting with team members, looking at data that you guys are gathering, uh, looking at trends and having this holistic approach to assessing the risk before we then implement any control measures. We then talk through controlling of those risks, which we'll, we'll get to in a moment, and looking at constant review and ongoing review of those control measures. Now, just to point out a couple of key factors of this flowchart you can see here from the, the model code of practice, you can see there's four steps, but you can see right in the middle of this flowchart is management commitment. So effectively, as acknowledged by Workplace Health and Safety here, is that without management commitment to this, without a culture of call it a speak up culture without a culture that really facilitates and acknowledges and destigmatizes psychosocial risk. Um, it's really hard to actually successfully manage and control psychosocial risks in your workplace. So we certainly need that management commitment. We're going to talk about ways that we can involve leadership and, and engage leaders to commit to this. And the other aspect I want to just call out as well is consultation. So it's all well and good for us as, you know, for us as Pinnacle Health Group as consultants or for you as a health and wellbeing leader or an HR leader at your workplace to identify what you feel are the hazards and the risks. But certainly that's, that's one perspective and one view of hazards and risks. We must take into account a 360 degree view of the hazards, the risks and the control measures. So that, that includes, as it, as it mentions there, consultation with team that can be a wide variety of team members from different business units and so on. It can be business leaders. It can be information provided by service providers that you might engage at your workplace. It can be externals, um, looking at external reviews as well, but effectively this sort of really uh, co-designed and co-consulted process to delivering psychosocial uh, risk management at your workplace. I might pause here for a moment because I realise I've gone from a pretty slow start to hitting it pretty hard with some information here. Is any of this, um, yeah, or oh, hopefully all of this is making sense? Are there any questions that come to mind to start with, guys? Just look, we've got some some nods. We're looking pretty comfortable so far. That's great. All right, I'll keep going, but just a reminder, you, you're welcome to stop me at any time. I do bang on a, a bit, so please stop me at any time throw a question in the chat box or hold on to the end and you can you can ask some questions there. Okay, so you've seen the model code of practice. Some of you will be familiar, some of you not. So hopefully that's a win if you hadn't seen that already. And as I said, we'll, we'll send you a link to that. And we've also acknowledged that the first step of risk management is to identify psychosocial hazards. Now, what are psychosocial hazards? Well, they, they come in really 
three key categories and, and they come in the categories of work design factors, work management or management of work factors and social factors. And you can see here from this scattered diagram that there are lots of them. And just to, just to mention a few here in those different categories. So in the category of work design, we have things like job demands. We have uh, sort of the physical design of work, whether that's remote working, as I'm I'm working remotely today, as you can probably tell, or isolated work. Uh, things like job control or traumatic events and, and material. So you know some uh, some workplaces part and parcel of of employees' responsibilities is dealing with trauma uh, day in day out. In other workplaces, these these traumatic events happen few and far between, but certainly. Uh, traumatic events can happen at workplaces, whether it's part and parcel of the of the day-to-day -day work or not. And identifying that as a hazard is absolutely crucial. So that's looking at work design. Management of work is more around things like having clear job descriptions and, and role clarity, uh, managing change and transitioning to different ways of doing things in the workplace, uh, having an appropriate reward and recognition program in the workplace, peer support programs, um, those sorts of things. It's about managing not just the flow of work, but how people are working and any changes to work. And finally, social factors. So they, like I touched on before, certainly we take our role seriously at Pinnacle Health Group that workplaces shape wellbeing behaviours and we're not just talking about physical wellbeing. So certainly workplaces, you know, we spend up to a third of our lives working and, and at workplaces, which might sound scary to some of you. So certain, certainly workplaces have a huge role to play in providing safe environments, but also providing socially engaged environments as well. So obviously things like preventing bullying and harassment, but providing social interaction and, and uh, opportunity for strong relationships with, with workers, colleagues, customers, and the avoidance of violence and aggression. So these are hazards that arise from different aspects of work. And basically it's our requirement as employers to identify and control these, these hazards and prevent them from becoming risks and then something that we need to manage down the track. Okay, again, I'll pause because we are getting into the nuts and bolts of today's session. Does anyone have any questions that have come up so far? All right, I'll take that as a as a keep flight, keep going, Josh, and we'll we'll go from there. Okay, so now again, this is from the Safe Work Australia Model Code of Practice. So we've just to take a little bit of a step back, we've identified that psychosocial safety is now uh, in legislation and something that every workplace must do, every PCBU must do. We've identi identified the flow chart, effectively how we can safely control risks and identify that that is something that we're all legally bound to do. Now we're looking at, we've then identified the psychosocial hazards and the three different types of psychosocial hazards um, that you can be exposed to in your workplace. Now we're going through what's called the psychosocial risk register. Now, again, if you work in the workplace health and safety space, you've probably been through this process with a physical hazard before, uh, a physical health and safety hazard or risk. But effectively what we're doing here is applying the same framework and using a similar type of register at your workplace to physical um, hazards and applying it to psychosocial hazards. So if we work through this example here, um, hopefully you guys can see that and the font's big enough here, but you'll see that the hazard here that I'm circling is high work demand. Okay, so that was work job demand or work demand was one of those um, one of those psychosocial hazards that we identified. And it says here, high work demand, end of, end of financial year sales. So this is obviously a workplace that, that have identified that in addition to the usual demands and, and stresses of work, we've identified that once a year, at the end of financial year, which is topical at the moment because we're we're getting close to the end of financial year, um, there's a there is a psychosocial hazard that exists. If we go to the next column, it says how frequently are workers exposed to this hazard. So this is effectively identifying, registering this as a hazard or a risk, and looking at how we can control that. So they're saying once a year because every financial end of financial year. How long does this exposure last? One month. So basically, there's a one month at this particular fictional workplace. Uh, there's a one month duration of high stress due to end of financial year. So it's sounding probably pretty familiar to a lot of us on the call. How severe is their exposure? They've mentioned here moderate. Most staff are, and, and the effects are that most, most staff are unable to complete essential tasks and report feeling stressed. So effectively, again, that's probably not uncommon to some of us on the call here, but the day-to-day -day business as usual work 
has probably been pushed aside during this month in order to meet those end of financial year job demands. Okay, how effective, oh, sorry, are there other hazards present that may interact with this? Well, the answer is probably always going to be yes here because not only is, is the end of financial year a thing for workplaces, but there's usually a, you know, like you'll understand with psychosocial uh, safety, everything interacts with with everything else. So certainly there's there's usually going to be some other hazards that interact with it. The, the example given here is that there's, there can sometimes be aggressive customers and low support from supervisors at this busy time. So if you think about your workplace, if there is a uh, a bigger stress or high demand at end of financial year, think of some of the work that you might have to push aside. Think of some of the meetings or the um, touching base with colleagues that you might need to defer during that busy time. And therefore, there's, there's a couple of hazards stacking up on top of each other there. Okay, how effective are the current controls? Uh, moderately, workers are encouraged to leave non-essential tasks. So effectively, the way they've managed it so far has been to push everything aside and deal with the, the end of financial year work, so to speak. Um, but what further controls are required? Well, additional workers to be assigned to busy shifts, so staffing up effectively. Um, but no doubt all of us on this call could think of a lot of other controls here. So there could be providing um, access to uh, physical and uh, psychosocial supports that are already in place at the workplace. It could be access to the employee assistance program at work. It could be um, some interventions at work, things like mental health first aid. It could be um, having some, even something basic like social interaction um, throughout that time that helps to control that risk in, in a multifaceted approach. Uh, anyway, you can see, I won't go through every single column here, but you can see that that's an example of managing and going through and using that framework to manage a, a super common risk there, okay? I'm looking at the time and already I'm absolutely been talking way too much. So we've seen an example of managing one risk there, one psychosocial risk. Okay, we're now gonna look at that in a broader, a broader view and, and looking at the process of managing psychosocial risks and how that fits into your broader health, safety and wellbeing strategy. And effectively what we're doing here is coming back to the space framework. So the SPACE framework, as we touched on before, represents structure, psychological support, awareness, champions, and evaluation. So effectively, if we put our hat on here of psych psychosocial risk and managing those risks, the summary of what I'm about to say is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel, okay? You don't need to see managing psychosocial safety as something that sits completely separate to your employee wellbeing strategy in the workplace. And in fact, you can access and use and engage with the supports that you already have in place with your employee wellbeing strategy as ways to, if we go back a step, manage these risks. So we touched on that before, high work demand as a hazard. There are lots of parts of your wellbeing strategy that no doubt would be able to assist in controlling that particular hazard, okay? And if we get specific around this, we, we go through this framework with a lot of our clients, the SPACE framework, but the first step in creating any wellbeing strategies to audit what's already in place. So that, that absolutely applies in the context of psychosocial safety. So what's already in place at your workplace? Do you have an employee assistance program? Do your employees get access to regular one-on-one -on -one conversations with their line manager, with their team? Uh, is there a peer support program, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Are they able to provide 360 degree feedback? Um, is there a speak up culture in the workplace? Do we see leaders champion psychosocial safety or broader well-being culture at the workplace or is there a feeling of you guys are just doing this because you have to we're not really encouraged to speak up or to to um you know really really share what we're feeling when it comes to psychosocial safety or, or well-being more generally um leadership involvement is absolutely crucial we saw that before smack bang in the middle of that model code of practice flow chart was commitment of management so it's absolutely crucial to to getting that involved and then measurement. So again, when we do an audit, what's already in place? What are we measuring when it comes to our employee wellbeing strategy? How can we apply that in the context of psychosocial safety and support? Now, we're right on one o'clock, guys. Sorry, I've only really got a slide or two to go. So feel free to hang around. If you do need to duck off and you have a one o'clock um, session, we are recording this so we can send you a recording so you can catch up with the last little bit. Um, but for those that are hanging on, we've probably only got a few more minutes left. So I'm um, sorry, as I said, I, I always struggle with 30 minute sessions. Um, now, if we're getting specific into the supports around psychosocial safety, so 
as you've probably cottoned on to here, that psychosocial safety and managing those risks at your workplace is very multifactorial and it's something that varies workplace to workplace. It's also something that you can't outsource and get someone in and say, hey, Pinnacle, can you can you tick the box of psychosocial safety to our workplace for us? It doesn't work that way. It involves an ongoing commitment. It involves internal resources at your workplace. Um, and attached to the strategy, there's also a lot of different services and supports that you can, you can implement. Now, some of those that you might already have in place at your workplace that can support and layer into your risk management are things like, I've touched on it a few times now, employee assistance program, mental health first aid, uh, mental health education and awareness. So whether that's training up leaders or it's training up individuals, whether it's involvement in um, awareness days such as Are You OK, which is obviously very uh, a very common thing to do in workplaces. Um, looking at things like team building and challenges, things that can really increase the wellbeing culture and the broader culture at your workplace as well. Um, touched on it before, it sounds like such an obvious one, but employees having regular access to one-on-one -on -one conversations and feedback from their team. Um, is that in place? And is and how can you implement that in your workplace? And as we touched on leaders training, it's really creating, you know, culture underpins everything here, guys. So if it's one thing to go through these processes and be doing it behind closed doors, but it's another thing to create awareness around it and really show all of the employees at your workplace that this is something that you take very seriously. And it's something that they're encouraged to really engage in as well. Okay, and finally, um, champions is something that we're we're hugely uh, we we place a huge importance at Pinnacle Health Group. You guys on the call here, you can't do this yourself at your workplace. Um, and whether that's rolling out a wellbeing strategy or whether it's addressing psychosocial risk, regardless of whether it's your job or not, you're going to need support in this, and that comes in the form of champions. So, champions can be any colleague it can be external support and external champions as well but really ideally you're getting champions internally and the idea here is that you know many hands make light work you're getting different perspectives in that consultative process um you're gathering data from dis different parts of the business but you're also sharing that message uh and and it's not the same voice saying the same things over and over again there's there requires of you and of your team often a business case to implement uh, psychosocial support. And again, thank you for those people that um, got back to me around what are the biggest challenges that you face in your workplace at the moment when it comes to psychosocial support. And and as I touched on before, someone came back and said, it's getting the leaders across why this is important. Well, like anything, any project or any, um, any undertaking in your workplace, often it's going to require a business case. And there is a really strong business case for this. It's not just because you should and because it's the right thing to do. There's a legal business case. It's now legislation. There's a financial business case. So obviously any funding that goes towards this, you're preventing workers' compensation claims, you're preventing injuries and all sorts of issues down the track. Um, and it is a safety, basically a safety responsibility. And a huge one as well is employee value proposition. So, you know, attracting, it's, it's an expectation now that employees are going to want to work for workplaces that, not only address psychosocial safety, but have a great wellbeing culture there and, and are across this. So um, it's a really great way to attack talent, attack, attract talent and retain talent as well. Sorry, I'm trying to speed up because I'm going way too fast here. Um, so just to summarize, and sorry, it's been a bit of a speed session today, but really if you take nothing else home from today's session is that the approach to psychosocial safety, this is not a new thing. You guys have probably been doing this in your workplace for many, many years when it comes to managing different types of risks. So it's the same process you're going through, just acknowledging those three different types of psychosocial hazards and acknowledging that you must address those hazards, maintain a register of those hazards and how you're addressing them, and then constantly review the control measures that you're putting in place. Effectively, keep talking about it, share it with champions, You know, share it with your leaders, and not only just share what you've done, but share what you plan to do and who you plan to involve at your workplace, because it has to be this consultative approach to, to deliver it. Um, and as we touched on before, leadership must play a big part in this. And if they're not, they're really missing a trick and, um, and, and they're going to really fall behind when it comes to creating a, a really great culture at the workplace. Um, and the final point there is just start the process. You know, like I said before, 
we've been talking about psychosocial safety now for, for over 12 months because our clients have really, it's been at the forefront of our discussions, but we still don't know, you know, probably half of what there is to know about this. So it's a constant evolution, a constant learning process. And we certainly welcome any questions from you guys, but welcome follow up the Safe Work Australia resources that we'll share are the, the absolute Bible on this. Um, and if you guys have any questions at all, either today or, or otherwise, um, please let us know. And with that, I will give you a break from my voice and um, and hand over to you guys if there's any questions. Maybe while we're waiting for some questions, I'll just acknowledge we've got Trent on the call today as well, who, um, if you're on the call earlier, he's our National Health and Wellbeing Manager. And basically, Trent, you know, maybe just to add some um, some weight to what we've discussed here, I mean, in terms of the conversations you're having with your clients at the moment, um, you know, broadly speaking, what sort of percentage are, are really identifying that psychosocial safety is a, um, is really important to them at the moment? Yeah, great question, Josh. I would say oh, at least at least 50 to 60% of the conversations that we're having on a regular basis are incorporating or have questions or we've covered some sort of um you know, content, I suppose, or just a discussion around psychosocial safety in the workplace. Um, and I think probably the key point for me out of this, Josh, you kind of mentioned smack bang in the middle of that flow chart was leader commitment required. Well, when, when we're talking about the space framework, I feel like almost that psychosocial support, whilst it's as part of the, um, the five-step process, could, could also almost sit in, smack bang in the middle of that of that as well, because I'd probably go so far as to say, if, if you don't have the um, support network for psychosocial support, you don't have the leader engagement and the leaders championing that speak up type approach, then all the effort that you're putting into the other four areas um, around structure, awareness, champions, all of those sorts of things uh, can be diluted because the employees are, impacted by the you know their comfort in the workplace so if they're not comfortable in the yeah. workplace they don't have those support measures in place then almost you're spinning your wheels with the rest of your program because they're not going to be as engaged uh, yeah, in those other things so that's probably the you know the to answer your question yeah at least 50 to 60 percent of those conversations we're, ha we're having uh, yeah. incorporate some sort of you know psychosocial support but that's probably what i've been trying to get across to most of the, the clients that I'm speaking with, um, both new and, you know, regular clients is that this is like needs to be done first or you need to, as you said, start with yep. this first um, and then start to build out around that. So, yeah. No, thanks. Yeah. So thanks for sharing, Trent. And, and it's good to to get an insight from you. And, and again, part of the reason for having this session, again, is just due to demand. We're getting lots and lots of questions. And again, we're, we're not professing to be the experts in it. Now, um, thank you. Terry's uh, popped a question through here, um, which is a really good question. Thank you for bringing this up. So the question is, do you know if there are any training qualifications available in this space? Great question. Um, a couple that come to mind immediately, Terry, um, and some of us at Pinnacle Health Group have actually been through the training here, but Flourish DX, um, are an organization and we can send this um we'll be sending a link to today's session along with that safe work australia model code of practice but flourish dx are one um you might have heard they run a podcast too and the name of it escapes me i think it's called the oh, I'll, I'll think of the name of the podcast but jason van she's the name of um the, the host of that podcast but basically they're an organization that have different levels of e-learning um there so they're, they're great um, also, we've uh, done a bit of work uh, with, oh, thanks, Trent. Trent's just popped that in the chat box there for anyone who wants to jump on that legend. Um, we've also done a bit of work with um, a lady called Anna Faringa, and Anna Faringa is a bit of an expert in psychosocial safety, and she delivers some more bespoke, customised training to workplaces, whether that be workplace leaders or, um, or individuals, and it can usually it involves sort of either executive level leadership or HR and, and health and wellbeing level leadership. Um, but she's also someone that, um, yeah, we, we have a really great relationship with as well. Um, so I'll, I'll pop some, perhaps a link as well to, to Anna. Um, oh, thanks, Trent. And Trent's then, she, yeah, the Psych Health and Safety podcast. I knew it was something obvious like that. that that's a really good podcast. Um, 
that goes into into depth around different aspects of um, psychosocial support. I should also, while we're talking podcasts, um, I should also give the Well Workplaces podcast a plug as well. That's hosted by our managing director, Tom Bosnar, and that's not a psychosocial specific um, podcast, but it, it covers all aspects of um, health, safety and wellbeing and has some really great leaders. And um, there are there are some specific uh, sessions and I, I believe Anna may actually be interviewed on, on that podcast as well. So that well worth a, well worth a look. Um, Tom has just popped in a couple of courses there onto the chat as well. We've, we've got a flooding of different resources here. And Tom, feel free to um, also share the link to the Well Workplaces podcast if you um, whilst you whilst you're sharing links. There it is. Thanks, Trent. Medium too. Um, great work. And again, if you if you're not getting all these links or clicking off to these, we'll we'll share these in the follow up as well. Um, I'll just check to see if there's any other questions. Feel free to ask some more questions here, guys. By the way. Um, looks like just links from now. So yeah, I mean, whilst you might be thinking of some other questions or typing them out, just before we get to that, thank you all for giving up um, your Wednesday lunchtime today and, and listening to us talk around this topic. As you can see, it is a very complex and multifaceted topic and something that we're, we're passionate about learning, uh, constant learning around the topic. And um, yeah, it's our responsibility with the workplaces that we work with to be across this and, and to, and to help guide those clients towards um, completing this at their workplace and, and creating a strategy at their workplace. So um, really appreciate you spending that time today and hopefully you got at least a few gold nuggets that you can take away and, and implement straight away. But if not, um, feel free. We, we'd love to hear some feedback. We'll send you a bit of a link to today's session as well as some, some other follow-up links and, and go from there. Um, but yeah, if there's no other questions, we can, we can, let you guys go. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll say goodbye now. And, um, yeah, we'll catch you all later. Thanks so much. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Trent. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Vanessa. Good work.